get started started here in five minutes. Um, but in the meantime, my name is John Fusco. We'll be continuing where we left off last week on a still life here. Um, welcome to paint along with me. We'd sure love to see. Just turn off my notifications. <laughs> um, we sure love to see what you've made. You know, small talk is so important, Emma. Thank you for that. Notifications, ringtone, beautiful. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, um, so welcome to Arful Connections, and um, yeah, we'll get really started here shortly. I'm um, just refreshing my paint, because, um, you know, oils don't stay wet forever, which is good, because then nothing would ever be done. Five minutes here, and we'll we'll do the real, the real, real. The brown paint is our friend. We're definitely doing brown paint. I came into possession of a whole bunch of brown paint a couple years ago. I have a drawer full still. So I've been trying to use it every chance I get. A, it was free. B, it is a really nice, rich dark. Not, not complaining about brown pink. Pretty, pretty cool color. Strictly speaking, it's a warm color, but I think you know what I mean. Okay. Severus blue. This is one of the strongest, gosh darn, blues. I know. A little bit goes so far. Like, it overpowers everything, but it's really rich, too. Uh, and it, and it kind of glows. It's, it's um, almost neon. And I love it. But it uh, so I tried, but I only had a little bit of that, so I tried to use. Uh, I try to keep it light. I try not to use too much at any given time. What I'm looking for now is another white, and since we have three minutes, I have a second to find it. Yeah, here we go. Flake white replacement, that's what we want. Flake white used to be made with lead. But obviously, uh, making stuff out of lead is pretty well frowned upon now. It's with paint. Um, so I don't know what they use instead, but it's a nice tacky, thick paint. Kind of translucent. Um, it's good for, like... They say it's good for um, skin, because you can build it up in layers. But I, I like it for a variety of reasons. The translucency, though, is definitely a bonus. It's always kind of funny stepping back into a painting you haven't touched in a week and have to kind of figure out where the heck my headspace was. Um, I think we're going to figure it out just by starting to make marks. Uh, I, I did make some marks on here since last time. Uh, otherwise, we'll just never get done. Uh, doing this one hour at a time. It usually takes me a good at least six or seven hours to finish a piece like this. Um, probably sometimes more. Um, so if I don't do a little work outside of these sessions, um, we'll never be finished. We want to get done eventually. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, it's as good as 11.30, I think, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is John Fusco. Welcome to Artful Connections. Today we'll be uh, doing a still life. 
working on still life. I started last week on this feed. I invite you to paint along with me. We'd love to see what you are working on at home. Uh, could be a still life, could be whatever you want. Could be oil paint, could be something else. I'll be using oil paint, but it could be uh, watercolor or acrylic. Um, a lot of the same principles we'll be applying, but I'll be talking about my process and how I'm building up this piece. Um, and, you know, since we already have a pretty good start here, and I'm pretty sure everything here is dry from last week. Yeah, everything here is dry. So, that'll be fun. Kind of build up those layers again. But, that's all right. We've got a pretty good start. And, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's dive in. So, um, I'm taking stock of what I have done and what um, I see here. I have some pretty basic like gestures of the reflections in the glass. I've got a pretty nice foundation of the lighting on the cup uh, and the orange. Now the orange looks to be floating though. I don't really have a very strong shadow here. And also the base and the background are um, not quite as resolved as I'd like them to be. So I think that's where I'm going to start is um, building up some material uh, in the back here. And so to do that I'm going to mix up my gray. And uh, yeah, add a little bit of linseed oil and a little bit of Gamsol to kind of stretch it out a bit. Um, we'll do some ultramarine. Now, I'm trying to remember how I mixed this up last time. I think I was using zinc. I mean, even if it's a little bit different, I've never been one to really quibble over that. Color matching is an important skill to practice, but... I don't know. I think uh, if you end up with a little bit of variety, that's also okay. Because color matching can also take a while. And uh, when you're trying to get as far as you can in one hour, I don't think we'll be doing that. Uh, we're worrying about that too much. Pretty cold day for spring. My studio um, actually gets pretty cold this morning. I opened the door and it's about 40 degrees in here. So, I'm super stoked that it has warmed up since then. Yeah, and that's a pretty decent little gray we've got. And I'm adding, I'm adding um, orange to kind of dull it a little bit. I have an alizarin um, orange here. And that's a pretty, that's pretty close, I think. Now, I'm going to throw a little more white in there. Yeah, and you know, there may be a more effective way to test the color rather than just putting it right on, but I've never really felt that strongly that it needs to be so precious as that. Um, yeah, now that's going on a lot thicker. That's a lot flatter. That's what we want. Um, I want that kind of like... Okay, I'm going to have a gradient back here, but I don't want to be able to see the bare spots um, quite as much. Yeah, so laying down just another layer, and I'm starting in the background, um, in part, uh, in large part, just because um, it's just easier to work from back to front. Anyone who's ever watched Bob Ross might remember that he was really big on that. Um, and I can't see the chat until I check the phone that's filming, so I will be glancing every now and again. But um, apologies if, um, if you do make a comment, and I don't get to it very quickly. I'll be trying to find the balance there. So yeah, this kind of, and I'm making like little X's um, just to keep the brush strokes from getting too flat. And it's okay if you go over. Um, I'm not really crazy about this. Like this is really deep purple. Um, this camera kind of dulls color a bit, but this is a pretty deep purple. This is also going to get grayed out a fair bit. It's a nice underpainting. I want that purple to shine through at least a little bit, but I'm ultimately going to be dulling it a lot so that our objects um, have more of an opportunity to pop. Um, and also, um, this is just a black t-shirt um, on my still life here. And uh, I don't want it to look black because, you know, even a black t-shirt is reflecting the color of the room. Um, in truth, um, it's, it's kind of seems to be reflecting, uh, I have gray walls, so yeah, I'm going to be pulling out those gray highlights, and then, yeah, sinking those dark darks. Um, and, yeah, tilting them all over the purple side, just because that's been the vibe lately. Um, so, definitely just going to do that. But, yeah, if you're just joining us, welcome to Artful Connections. My name is Jonathan Fusco. 
and we're working on a still life in oil today i invite you to paint along with me please share anything you make in the comments below we would love to see it you don't have to be a still life doesn't have to be oil that's just what i'm working on uh, and that's just what i'll be talking about today whatever you like Just kind of, I, mean, I am going to try and brighten it up on this side a little bit, kind of keep a gradient from light to dark, because that kind of, well, that's what's happening on the wall over here. Plus, it'll create a little visual interest from left to right behind, and we want that. Um, I have done paint with just super flat backgrounds, and those can be kind of fun and um, challenging to create as well. But, um,. Today I kind of want to put a little life in there, I think. There we go. That isn't so bad. We're going to throw some more white in there. Brighten it up. And then a little... Because, yeah, this, this can stay pretty thin, so I'm throwing a little Gamsol and a little linseed. Just to stretch it, just to stretch it out a bit. Um, definitely want some contrast here though. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's what we want. Okay. gives it a little bit of a halo too which is a cool effect not opposed to that at all cool. we can kind of... we're listening to Bach by the way <laughs> I'm just trying to think of what's royalty free and we'll get a shut down I think we'll be okay with Bach um, should be okay all right, so what next? I think we're going to go into the bottle. We're going to go into the bottle. I'm pulling some magenta. Just straight Kinacridone magenta here. Uh, we're going to drop a little ultramarine into it. Fun fact with ultramarine, it used to be a gram for gram, worth about as much as gold, because uh, it was made of lapis lazuli. So, like, throwing um, ultramarine into your paintings was, like, just real... That's high cotton right there. That was um, a pretty big deal. So you see, in, um, in that era, before they found a way to manufacture it cheaper, um, it was a, it was a, they would, they would uh, save the ultramarine for, like, a really prominent part of the piece. So it was uh, supposed to really stand out. So everybody could tell just how rich and and uh, wealthy whoever owned this painting must be. Um, it's basically like painting in gold. Uh, I don't I don't think the one that I have here is made out of lapis lazuli. I'm pretty sure they made it out of something synthetic, and that's fine. It's still pretty. I don't know a lot about pigments, but, but I, I know that one. Um, so I'm just sinking my darks a bit. Um, just trying to reestablish, or rather further establish, my values. And I'm doing this in part to kind of re-familiarize myself, get my hands back uh, used to working on this piece again. That's part of it. Um, but it's just something that also needs to be done. But it's 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 also kind of easy to like just gives me an opportunity to trace along the surface and tune in a little bit, I, which might sound a little woo woo, but um, I don't know. It feels real to me. And I think we're gonna drop some of the same shadow color under the object. So let's go ahead and do that. I've got everything pretty well isolated. I know where my darks are going to go and where my lights are going to go. There's not a lot of risk of 
cross-contamination in this moment, which is a concern. There's not a lot of risk of that yeah, anymore. Early on, you want to be careful. Um, I've heard it said both ways, like, oh, you have to start with your darks, get your darks in first. And I've also heard it said, oh, start with your lights and then work darker. Um, in both both cases, I mean, they both they both be very passionate and very certain arguments about why you should do one over the other. Um, personally, I've done it both ways. <laughs> I think they're both fine. Um, I typically start with my darks and work brighter. Well, I like to start in the middle. That's really what I do. I like to start in the middle and work in both directions. Um, I do the same thing in drawing. I like to start on toned paper. I like to start in the middle and then push out from the center into the brights and into the darks. Um, I don't really like starting with bright white that much, that much for sure. But um, beyond that, I think it's largely a matter of style, personal preference. Sink a little. Yeah, I got a little tower of dark right there. Oh. Pardon me. All right. Hey, Val. How are you doing today? Happy Monday. Um, yeah, just kind of tracing along here. Sinking those shadows. I, I know I'm kind of repeating myself, but it just takes a couple minutes, and um, I'm supposed to be talking about what I'm doing. But what if what you're doing can be described in a in like a sentence, and then it takes like a, like a minute or two to to do? Um, well, then I guess you just keep repeating yourself. What do you think of more fun facts, which I'm sure will come to me? I like painting glass a lot. Um, I should do it more than I do. I, I um, it's just such a cool effect, and it makes you feel like you're a lot better at painting than you might actually be. Because it's kind of an easy, you know, relatively, it is not the hardest thing to pull off. Um, in fact, like I think that if there's anything that's really the hardest to pull off, it's probably smooth round objects. Um, Um, so the, the mug kind of qualifies, it's smooth and round. Uh, yes, like that. But like trying to like paint a ball freehand, that's a hassle. That's a real hassle off right there. But like the orange is kind of it's not a circle, and it's not smooth, it has texture. Um, actually, what I learned last time, I haven't painted a lot of oranges, um, and we did a still life for um, for workshop. And uh, it's posted on my page, you can go see it even. It has a lemon and an orange in it, but I found the orange was by a wide margin the easiest thing to paint in that one. And it kind of got me thinking that if anybody really wanted to like get into painting they'd never painted before, but they kind of want to feel like they're making progress, which can be important, especially if you're trying to keep pumped about a new practice, because it's largely, it's mostly discouraging to start anything and get into anything. Um, but if you start with an orange, you might you might walk away feeling pretty, pretty awesome, because uh, I was a little surprised just how few marks it took to make an orange feel, feel real. So practice painting oranges, maybe, is the takeaway there? I'm not actually sure about that. Don't quote me on that, but it's a it's a suspicion. All right, so I'm sinking my darks in. I do want to change the color of the cloth as well. Um, it won't be quite as bright as this. I think I'm going to keep it kind of on the warmer end. But it's going to be much grayer. So I told you guys a little bit earlier, if you joined me, Early, early, I brought up brown pink. Yeah, now that is actually a pretty dang cool color. And I don't think I've ever brightened it up this much. I usually use it in darks. But this, this is, um, it's almost like a sienna. Uh, that's super cool. All right. 
Yeah, let's do that. I'm just making things up as we go. Here, I mean, I, there are rules I'm following, I suppose, but I, I often feel like I'm making it up as I go. Um, oof, not quite, not quite, that's too dark. It looked so much brighter on the palette, but not next to that orange. All right, how about that? Is that what we want? Yeah, okay, that's actually, that might be exactly what we want. So I'm kind of, I'm putting in my lights and I'm tracing along where I see the wrinkles um, in life. So yeah, just sort of, and, and I, anytime you're painting anything, it is a good idea to try to act as though your hands are tracing along the object. So, um, you know, if I'm if I'm going along the mug, I want to go along the mug as though I'm as though I'm tra uh, brushing along its round edge, so that the brush direction describes the form as much as the light and shadow. Uh, so with the wrinkles, it's a little bit trickier to do, but it's still something I'm trying to keep in mind. Um, I just try to think about the the direction each surface is twisting and turning as I'm making those marks. And again, I did do a little work uh, between last Monday and today on this. Um, just a little bit. I think that um, I did a little work onto the apple and some of the reflections, and I think some of the stuff up here, just to jumpstart this process. But I'll try to keep it something you guys get to ride along with the whole way, but, um, but we'll never be done. <laughs> if I only work on them during these streams. I'm, a, I'm not a very fast painter. Um, well, it depends. But th this this is going to be enough to keep me busy for at least probably six hours um, to be satisfied with it. So after today's session, I might put another hour into it, and then I'll wait till next week. We'll dive back in. Yeah, I think that's the vibe. This is this is um, definitely the color, though. And I like it. I like it because it's um, it's gray. So it's falling back. Um, so my more colorful shapes um, are sitting on top of it. They really feel like they're resting on top. Um, there are a couple of tricks to make anything feel like it needs to come forward. Uh, one way is, to, is blue. Um, things that are cool tend to fall back in space. Things that are warm tend to come forward. Um, but also saturation. So the more saturated something is, the more it seems to be coming forward. The less saturated, the more it falls back. Um, and so that's kind of the trick I'm doing for the cloth, because I want the cloth to feel like it's in front of the backdrop. And so warming it up is a great way to do that. Um, but graying it out, make sure that the objects still feel like they're resting on top. Plus, this is just kind of a nice gray, but that purple is still shining through. Um, and that's one reason I like to do underpaintings in bright colors, because this the ways that it interacts with the final color can be um, a real delay. I'm just going to check the chat here. Cool. But um, like I brought up last week, um, the way I try to approach any painting, every painting, any drawing, everything, I try to think of it a little bit. I had an art teacher um, who talked about rendering, like focusing a camera. Um, and I find that whenever I've taught art, this is something I have to keep saying. And I have to keep telling myself, uh, it is really, really hard to not like get invested in details you know and just the one and there are people who work that way um I've, I've seen those like process videos where somebody like starts from one corner and they just paint the whole thing um and if your mind works that way then uh, awesome um but but if uh but if it doesn't if you're anything like me my mind does not work that way i do better treating it like a camera and trying to develop the whole piece um as a whole in unison at the same time is what that means. So, yeah, definitely 
definitely advocate um, that approach. It's, it certainly helps me a lot. Um, starting simple, working more complicated. A lot of these are still very simple shapes. I'll just be slowly refining them more and more as we go. Um, I'm constantly checking against my still life. Um, it's so easy to get caught up in like, oh, what do I want it to look like, you know, or like what I think an apple looks like, what I think an orange looks like, what I think the glass should be doing. But if I do that for too long, I'm going to lose track of what's actually happening, and we don't want that. So um, I'm actually going to put a little of that color in the glass because the glass is reflecting everything around it. So another great way to cheat with glass. I mean, those these colors are there, but I'm exaggerating them a bit because we can. Because if there's one thing paint is good at, it's it's at putting the the world in italics. And uh, that's I think um, one of my favorite qualities of the medium is that it puts the world in italics. It'd be a lot faster to uh, take a photo of this and call it good, but I I think if we paint it, we're gonna discover something new about it. Maybe not profound, but new. A little bit different, at least. I'm just reestablishing some of my shadows here. Um, as I'm noticing things like this here is unresolved, so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to resolve it. Um, I think the plan is we're going to drop the bottom out a little further this way. And I need a smaller brush. Um, I don't have a mall stick proper. I use a cane. But it basically, um, it's just a place to rest your hand. If you can't remember what, I mean, some of this painting is dry, but I just don't want to have to remember what's dry and what's not. So we're just going to do that. There we go. And yeah, the cane only works uh, for paintings up to a certain size. It can't be a little taller than the cane, but for this stuff, it's fine. At some point, I'm going to have to get a real mall stick. But um, in the meantime, the cane's been working pretty good. If it's near the edge, I can normally just rest my hand on the easel, so, so not to smear. I know there are charcoal artists who do the same thing, um, only they like place a board over their drawing and then rest their arm on the board, um, and that way you don't smear. Because uh, in a way, charcoal never dries. <laughs> um, at least oil paint, you know, you leave it for three or four days. You can pretty much just touch it and move things, uh, or paint paint right over it if you need, without having to worry about smearing. But I do like to float my arm as much as I can, because uh, that's sort of where you get sort of those wonderful little wobbles that'll capture like your particular neurotic energy that you're bringing to the piece that day. Um, I think that's one of the things about Van Gogh's work that's so um, enchanting is just how. The particular wobble that his um, marks had, unique to him, all his own. And um, if you're, you know, you work super clean, you won't catch that energy. Um, now, that's okay if that's what you want. But for me, I, I like to, um, I like to capture a little bit of neurotic energy. Uh, in a lot of my artist statements, I often say that all of my work is to some degree about mental health. And um, I suppose with the still lives, <laughs> that's about the only way <laughs> that it's about mental health. It's a little bit of a stretch, but still capturing that little essence of where we're at today. And if you're just joining us, welcome to Artful Connections. Working on a still life today in oil. My name is Jonathan Fusco. I invite you to paint along with us if you like. Uh, it does not have to be a still life. It does not have to be oil. And we would love to see it. Please share it in the comments below if you are painting along. If you just feel like hanging out today, been watching, or popping in and out, that's also totally cool. I personally love watching people paint. I can only hope this is similarly enjoyable. Um, and whenever 
I don't know what to watch, I often just put on people making things on YouTube. It's a pretty fine way to live. Um, so, what have I been doing? Um, the bottle is bothering me. It's, it's largely unresolved. I have a mirror back here. Um, where is it? It's right here. Um, and mirrors are really helpful for helping um, if you've been looking at something too long, and I have. Uh, this has been in my studio all week, so I have been inadvertently looking at it too much. And I can't really see it. But if ever you're having that problem, like, like you, you're pretty sure that you're just seeing what you want to see, um, but you kind of suspect that there's something wrong, um, I'm actually a little surprised how many people I know do this. Uh, I know some very talented people who never do this, and it'll always blow my mind, because I've come to rely on it so heavily. But look at a mirror. Uh, put, uh, put, put your back to your piece, hold up a mirror, or go find a mirror and hold it up in the mirror. Uh, and you might be surprised just how much it tells you about um, where you're at. At least, especially with like symmetry, it can be really helpful because you might start thinking you're symmetrical when you're not. Um, anyway, if you haven't pieced it together, uh, I realized that this was pretty wobbly and I couldn't figure out exactly what, how and in what way. Because as much as I want those little wobbles, I also want it to be uh, relatively symmetrical. I'm not trying to. I want it to represent the object, and the object is. Symmetrical. So anyway, I held it up in the mirror to help me. I held up the mirror to help me decide where I needed to be. And I'm glad I had this background color already mixed up, so I can kind of just carve into it like stone. And yeah, just kind of make little corrections as we go. And I'm looking again to see what else I needed to change. Well, and actually, I think what we want, instead of removing the bottle, I think we actually want to add a whole bottle. Yeah. And we're going to have to brighten up that edge in a little bit. And I'm adding dark there. So it's going to turn gray, but I kind of want the light that I add there later to be gray anyway, so just kind of planning ahead here with that. Cool. You know, one reason it's really handy to work on the back object first and get as much of this resolved as possible, especially this part, is because of all the places that the cup goes over it. If I can establish um, and mostly resolve the bottle behind the mug, then as I'm painting the mug and going over those marks, I won't, um, I don't know, it doesn't make more sense than having to like paint the mug and then be constantly wrestling back and forth, foreground, background, foreground, background. Just do the background and the foreground and mostly resolve it every time as best you can, especially when you have overlap. Um, just so you're not wrestling later with the interaction between those two. So, all right. Well, thank you, Cody. I'm glad you enjoy them. That's sort of my hope. Bob Ross always means nap time for me. Maybe we shouldn't be doing these in the morning. Maybe I should think of something more energetic. Um, the truth is, almost none of my process is all that energetic. I do like to stand normally, um, but for these I've been sitting. But I prefer to work standing. In part because, yeah, it kind of keeps your body more engaged. And I find myself slouching on the stool. Um, but for little pieces, it's easier to sit. Ooh, you know what we want. We're going to switch to the mall stick and that 
So, I know I was just saying that we need to resolve the background first, but then I just had this sudden urge to start working on the mug a little bit. And I, I don't have a good reason for that. It just kind of took me. And now I'm realizing I have to justify it, and I don't have a way to do that. It just felt right. Um, I'm not going to do a whole lot near the bottle. Um, I mostly wanted to hit this lip here. I wanted to see what that did to the contrast. And actually, I can bring this color up to the top here as well. Yeah, okay. But yeah, I've never had much of a steady hand, so the stick helps a lot with that. If you find that your hands shake, highly recommend. Um, I just ordered this off uh, the internet, and I don't think it was very much. I think it was like $10. Not too bad. And I've gotten um, a lot of mileage out of it. In the, I think I got it about a year and a half ago, and I've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. Total game changer. Especially if you're trying to get a lot done and your paint's still wet. You don't want to have to keep taking breaks and waiting a couple days. I mean, we're spending a lot of time at home right now, um, so not trying to waste too much time. We can just get something done. Um, and uh, so, um, something that typically happens with white objects is they tend to, I mean, everything does this, but white objects especially, or off-white as this one is, uh, they tend to reflect all the colors around them. So um, I have the orange right here, and I'm going to, it actually is a really nice glow in life, and I'm going to be playing that up. Um, but even if it wasn't um, particularly loud in life, I would probably be exaggerating it anyway, just to kind of unify the piece and have um, all these colors kind of unifying in each of their forms, reflecting one another all over. Glass is a great way to establish that in a piece, because uh, you're just going to get that even on accident, you're going to end up with that. Um, but it also happens in life. So uh, again, painting, for me, I, I like it to put life in italics. I want it to feel kind of um, extra real, if that makes any sense. They use the term hyperrealism. Um, I would call this super real. Uh, there is a movement called the contemporary realists, and they do a lot of really brushy stuff and kind of play up color changes and things. And maybe that's what I'm doing is contemporary realism. I'm not really sure. But it isn't hyper real. That much I know. No, I'm not doing that. Those cats have patience, I'll tell you. They work hard. I think I want to bring in this color of hair. Yeah, just a hair. I'm also, I mean, you know, you hear, you pick things up. People instruct you one way or the other on how to do things, and you just pick on, a, pick up on the ways that work for you or that make sense for you. And um, another one I really liked was to think of drawing and painting like carving. You like start with a shape, like a big hunk, like it's marble or clay, and then just start to shave it. Cut into it with darks, pull it forward with brights, and that kind of back and forth. But thinking of it like carving, especially with painting, it makes the most sense to me with painting. Charcoal too, um, I suppose it works as well. Um, This helps me a lot. So whenever I'm trying to change something to shape, I always feel a little like I'm carving. But yeah, the whole thing's flat, but it's just a helpful way to visualize it. I'm mostly happy with the shape of that bottle. It's not like super perfect. I'm going to have to wobble it here and there a little bit, but largely starting to get pretty stoked on it. So. I'm going to break out the tiny brushes. I mostly work in brights um, for early stages. I like to pull out the rounds for um, the later, later process. But um, I like brights because 
bright just meaning like these short square brushes. Um, I like them because it's just easier to think in planes th that way, um, you know, as something kind of turns and shifts away from you just breaking it up into individual planes. Um, it can be a lot easier. Plus I just think they look neat. Um, it just kind of looks cool and I think that's also a super valid reason to use anything you like. Uh, I know a lot of artists who mostly just work in brown, uh, uh, rounds. Um, I have a couple rounds. Most of them are very small. I confess I've largely been collecting brights. I'm, I'm in a bright phase is what I should say. I might, I might try and do a painting using only rounds and see how it goes. Just because you never want to get stuck in a rut. You don't want to get stuck in a rut, and I need to make that orange a little bit smaller in the reflection. Um, if you're doing it by the books, you're only looking at your painting half the time or less. I'm, I'm not good at that, but you do always want to be looking as often as you can at what you're actually painting. As hard as it is, it, it's, so, it's so important. Um, it really does pay off. If you can keep that discipline, uh, it makes all the difference. Also, last time I was having a hard time getting my palette and the still life and the painting all in one frame, and I'm pretty sure we did it this time, and I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, pretty big, pretty big day. Alright. So... Here. Yeah, I'm not real good at working front to back. I get distracted. Again, if you're doing it by the book, I'd be, I'd be adhering a lot more to the front to back, or pardon me, back to front policy. But I like to bounce around a little more than that. Um, certainly with my more uh, often. I'm misspeaking a lot. That is a sign of sleep deprivation. I thought I could go to sleep. It's not up to us. All right. And what I'm doing here is there's like a lot of really cool light bouncing around inside the mug that I haven't captured. Ooh, was that? Um, so I'm just getting some of that in behind the apple before I get into the apple proper. Again, back to front. Um, and we do have some cool stuff happening in the bottle up here, so I'm going to start carving some of that in. That needs to be a touch brighter, though. It needs to be a, just a touch brighter. Thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to paint for you all. It is a treat. An absolute treat. That was cool. I've got the hunger shakes. I had a little breakfast, but I'll come back. There we go. But we can always you know, steer it. That's the other thing I like about oil paint. You can kind of steer your marks after the fact. You can put the paint down and then come back to it and kind of steer it. And in fact, like this is too bright right here. I don't want it to be this bright. But I can go over it with another color and kind of push it down. Okay, I already have the mark established, but now I can kind of, yeah, just, just kind of cool it a little bit. Like, you're, you're a little loud, man. We need you to sit down. Can you please sit down? 
And I'm just telling it to sit down with a little gray here. No reason to get excited. There we go. That is substantially more reasonable. Okay. And actually, now that I know that's a color I want, I'm going to use a little more. And then hit the very edge of this. Ooh, opera. Spotify is bringing the fire today with this Bach playlist. I'm not that familiar with Bach. It's one reason to start playing Bach. Um, in college, I listened to a lot of Frederick Chopin, but that stuff's pretty moody. Um, not that Bach isn't, but it's it certainly isn't as brooding. Um, Chopin had a lot of feelings. Is the impression I get. I love it. Homeboy had a lot of feelings. Definitely. Definitely a thing. Cool. Alright. But yeah, I mean, glass is really just a series of lights and darks. So I'm just like, all these little reflections. Um, yeah, there's some nuance. And with oil, it's a little easier. Because you can kind of push and pull things a bit. Like, I have... This highlight right here um, goes a little too far, so I can kind of push it back with a... This is a dry brush, this is nothing on it. And I can kind of pull it down, I want it to come down a bit, so I'm going to pull it down like that. Yeah, and then I need to come back in with my darks. Push and pull. I'm sure you're beginning to see how you could just spend hours and hours doing this. Um, I mean, I guess if I set out to do a speed painting, you can do that. You gotta then you're doing that thing where you and maybe maybe next week we'll try that, um, where you really force yourself to decide what is the most important thing here to describe these shapes. Um, that might be fun. You know what? Next week, I think I I think I'm next. I think on Monday next week. I'll look at the schedule. Assuming I'm Monday next week. Next week. Maybe we do a speed painting. Maybe I just finish this thing, because this apple's going to wilt and I want to eat it. Same thing with the orange. They're not going to last much longer. They're not long for this world. I, got, I bought that apple three weeks ago. So I should eat it. It still looks okay, though. It's doing fine. It's edible. Cool. Yeah, glass is fun. I think if I did a speed painting, I would keep it to one object, but maybe it would, or, or two. Um, maybe uh, we'll do just the bottle. Or I have a, actually have a collection of these things. I have way too many knickknacks. If anyone's in the market for knickknacks, hit me up. I have so many growlers I should not have. Um, I will mail you a growler. All you have to pay is shipping. Um... Totally disinfected growler. It's a pandemic after all. Can't be too careful. Actually, from what I hear, you can be too careful. I'm, I'm told um, that some of the stuff we've been doing, I've been doing it too, is A, not helpful, and B, yeah, just a little overzealous. But I still don't feel right not wiping down my groceries, even if, like, even if it's a little paranoid. I guess that's something they're not recommending. So I'm noticing some wrinkles I missed. The darks, so just as I notice them, just bringing them back in. Just keep describing everything. Again, treating it all about as evenly as I can. Yeah, I haven't done a lot on the orange yet. I'm just not that worried about the orange. Again, I don't think the orange is going to take that long. I kind of want to make sure I have everything else largely where I want it, and then I'll clean up the orange, and then we'll be done. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying, I'm just checking to see how much time we have left, what can we reasonably expect to get done, about 15 minutes, so how am I going to prioritize here, um, I think the bottle is the name of the game, I might throw some marks in other places, but I would like to get the bottle as resolved as I can today, but yeah, um, 
remaining focused on any one object. I just I have developed that habit of like bouncing around the piece so often that I have a hard time not doing it, even when like I probably should dial back. Like whenever I stop thinking about it, I just start painting other parts of the painting. Painting other parts of the painting is a great sentence. Here, I'm gonna mix in some of my reds. I could like go over all the reds I have on here. There's just a lot. The gist of it is I typically keep a nice bright red. In this case, naphthol, and I typically keep a magenta or two, like a purple, and then a canacridone magenta. Uh, then I have some light, um, some light magenta as well, and a brilliant pink. For the brights, um, just they're really nice, uncorrupted, nice little shortcuts. Uh, I wish I had more yellows. At the moment, all I have for yellow is Indian yellow and um, lemon, uh, cadmium lemon, which are fantastic, both of them. But I'd like to have more breadth to my yellows, so that's in the future is collecting more yellows. But I definitely like to have lots of reds. And I'm just gonna carve in my darks right here. Yes. I want my cane for this part, because the reflection catches these little edges around the apple, and I, I like that part, so I definitely want that. Um, also what I want that I don't have here, also what I want, is I want some of the nuance in the apple in the reflection. It doesn't have to be real refined, it doesn't have to be super. In fact, it's probably better that I keep it, keep it somewhat vague. Good, good bet that that's what I ought to do, and I'm gonna do that, keep it a little bit vague, but I want some of that surface of the apple, so it's not just a red donut. I want, like, that green kind of turns brown. There's like a little green in this apple. It turns a little bit brown in the reflection, so I'm gonna play that up. Throw a little yellow in there. Yeah, I think that's the color. It's sort of a brownish, pinkish yellow. I think that's what we want. That's pretty dang close. Yeah, actually, that's that's on the money. That's the color. You can't necessarily. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing when I'm working this small with the camera as far away as it is. But I'll um, I'll pull my hand away. Maybe it'll be clearer pretty soon. And then there's just some little reflections in there. We're just gonna go ahead and do that now too. stretch because class is a way of stretching. It's a way of stretching everything. Cool. And just while I have this color, I'm gonna see if there's anywhere it fits on the apple itself. And it does, turns out. Um it's it's a pretty good match for um sort of these like off-colored marks, the parts that kind of come away from the stem. Um, not a bad fit, so I'm going to throw some of that in there, build up a little history over there. And then it's not too far off from this reflection either, so we're going to throw it into the reflection in the apple of the mug. It's the mug reflecting in the apple. Yeah, so the apple needs work, but... Mostly worried about the bottle today. Yeah, we made some pretty good progress. This is not not bad. I haven't looked at the chat in a while. Take a glance. Well, y'all are just chilling. This is awesome. This is good. Yeah, just hang out with me on Monday mornings on your lunch hour. If, in fact, you have a lunch hour right now. 
in which case mazel tov that's awesome So again, pushing those darks again. There's all kinds of fun things that are happening in the bottle, and I am not trying to capture all of it, but I do want to capture most of it. Since the bottle is center, um, it's just kind of like, it begs for that kind of attention. Um, at least to me. You know, there's a lot of ways to do a still life, and certainly there are plenty of people who are, through history, who are far more successful than I am, who would do, um, who would describe a bottle like this with a lot less. And they are also correct, but just my inclination is to keep it loose, but not so loose that um, I don't get to explore all that nuance. I just love the nuance. I love it. I love it. That's what makes still lives fun for me. I used to hate still lives, but um, I've, I've developed a new appreciation for them. Part of it is that a teacher didn't, you know, when, when somebody else selects your still life for you, like, that's always a little lame. Because uh, still lives are kind of, they're strangely personal. There's probably an element of um, self-portrait in them just in the selection process of your objects, like what you consider to be um, worth painting um, and uh, how you arrange it. It's a very personal. Because, you know, you can go outside and do a landscape, and yeah, how you frame it, that's personal, but everything that you paint outside is already there when you got there. Um, the still life is typically, at least the, what I, what, the way I'm doing it today, is completely arranged. Um, I suppose I could just paint our dirty sink, you know, and collaborate with my roommates in that way. But uh, but when you've arranged it, it, yeah, it's kind of a personal preference thing. And so I remember painting still lives in class and college, and just like it was just so hard to get excited about them. It wasn't mine. Um, you know, these are just objects that my teacher thinks are cool. Instructor thinks are cool. I'm mixing up a color, um, there, there's a really cool reflection of the wall behind it, behind the bottle. And I'm trying to decide what that color is. It's a little hard to discern. It's a, it's a kind of gray, I'm going to be saturating it a bit more than that. But I want some of that gray blue in it. So I am... Um, that. Oof. This is a new brush, and it is shedding hairs like nobody's business. That's actually kind of uncool, but we're... We already have paint on it, so let's just try it. I was watching a calligraphy artist once, and she said that her instructor told her that a, a good brush is a calligraphy brush. A bad brush is a painting brush. Which um, <laughs> is a, an interesting distinction. I um, I certainly would go so far as to agree that your brushes don't have to be in like perfect shape to paint, although it will change your marks. Kind of depends on what marks you want, because the tool really matters. Okay, let's get a little crazy. And let's just pop that in. And let's pop that in. And actually, that's too far out. We're just going to redo that. But that pink glow isn't going to go anywhere. Um, I'm going to keep little hints of that there. If I, if I do it right, I won't lose that. Because um, I, I personally really like it. I think it... Again, it's part. It speaks to the history of the piece, the way it was built up, and it just gives it a really nice glow. That kind of super reality I was talking about, kind of a dreamlike quality. Um, cool. Cool. 
How much time do I have? I just don't want to go over five minutes. Well, that flew by. I should end doing something kind of exciting. So maybe I'll pull out a nice bright. Get a nice bright going. I'm using my um, my light magenta here, and I'm going to use the flake white. Not made with lead in the modern world. No lead involved. Thank goodness. And some of my lemon. Yeah, that is obnoxiously bright. I love it. Okay, we're going to throw some more white in it. Uh, titanium white is a really strong white. I use it occasionally. But I use it a lot less than I used to. Um, I had one instructor in particular who turned me on to that. I'm really grateful for that, because once you realize... How many other ways you can create lights without just like soaking something in white and just killing all that color? Uh, it's just a total game changer. There's no other way to put it. Just a total game changer. So we're going to go down the line here and we're going to get our a nice... There's a really cool core reflection and I'm just going to catch little hints of that. It's in a couple different colors. I see some blue and some yellow. So I'm going down and doing the yellow first. Just very carefully, just kind of dropping it in. Just a little. Just a touch. It's so tempting to just use Bob Ross expressions. Two hairs and some air. So light. Um... I think I want, what do I want? I want this one. Okay, now uh, for the other highlights that are a little more on the blue side. This will probably be the last thing we do today. We're going to drop in some real bright blues. So just got to brighten this up. Yeah, flake white is super gooey. It's like tacky. It's awesome. I love it. But we're going to thin it a little bit, just so I can maneuver with it a little bit easier. But yeah, if you want to lay, like, do a painting like, really thick, um, that, that texture in flake white is really nice for, like, impasto painting. If you're familiar with impasto. Okay. And we just had a couple blue spots we're going to get. We're going to get that one. Yeah. Right there, this one right there. And we had kind of a, we have a little bit of stripe right here. And there's just a little guy right here. And as I bring everything else, there's some other reflections that are going to get brightened up on the edges here. And they're brightened, uh, bright up the, um, I don't know what it's called, but the little part that pops the lid off. Uh, once I get that a little brighter, these bright spots will make a little more sense. Right now they're standing out like a sore thumb. I suppose one thing I can do to balance it right now, without much trouble, is to add the red. The red stopper at the top. And, um, gosh, we're out of time. I'm going to move this. Let's see if I can't give a better view to end on. Yep, that's where we're at. So, thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time today. It has been a delight and a privilege. Stay safe out there. Till next time, take care.